Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, second wave of uh, Thrombosis 360, uh, sponsored and organized by Bayer. And uh, uh, welcome to uh, this evening, which uh, uh, hopefully will be very educational to all of us. Uh, we have prepared uh, two very interesting topics for you to, uh, tonight. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, about atrial fibrillation in diabetic patients uh, and uh, stroke uh, risk. And uh, the second is on uh, management of thromboembolism, venous thromboembolism. Uh, we will uh, take questions uh, during the talks and also at the end of uh, each talk. Uh, we have uh, 15 minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, get them uh, posted to us and we'll try and get the speaker to uh, answer them. Uh, during the talks, there will be also questions. So you can, uh, you can, you can vote your answer uh, and the uh, speaker will, uh, will try and explain uh, the correct answers and discuss the uh, uh, implications of the questions. Uh, at the end of the uh, of the of the webinar, they, 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 they will be obviously uh, CME, and you will have a certificate uh, to assure that you have attended this uh, this meeting. Uh, uh, without really uh, taking any much of uh, of everybody's time, we will just go ahead to the first speaker, Dr. Wakar. Uh, will uh, talk to you about. Uh, atrial fibrillation in diabetic patients and stroke risk. Uh, Dr. Wakar. Thank you. Uh, I'll let me just share the screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? So, can you hear me and can you see me, my screen? Yes, you yes, can Omar, see the screen, see. yes, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Omar, for a nice introduction. And uh, actually, just to clarify, uh, my colleague, Dr. Bassam, is gonna talk about stroke and fibrillation. Though, uh, yes, I am a stroke lead and I'm a stroke physician, but I'm gonna talk today about the BTE treatment uh, and how we can extend our treatment as per our patient risk profile. So without further ado, uh, we just gonna go to the objectives of my session today. Uh, uh, so we'll first talk about our case, okay? Uh, how, uh, and we'll, I'll talk you through the case uh, throughout uh, this, my session. I'll talk about the VTE treatment itself, and the VTE treatment, uh, whether it's a choice, or whether it's my choice, or whether it's your choice, or whether it's a patient's choice. We'll then talk about briefly about the guidelines, what the guidelines say. So of course we can say about which is best or which is not best, but does the, does the guidelines support that or not? We'll then talk about our case and keep talking about the case throughout my session. Uh, and just final slide about the future. So let's take you to our patient who is Antonio, who is a 67 years old gentleman who is obese. He had no past medical history. He had a recent long haul flight from the UK. Okay. So, uh, so just imagine th th this is actually pre-COVID. So don't, don't start thinking about COVID at this time. So just come out of the COVID for now. And he had a recent long haul flight from the UK and came with the breathlessness and presented to the AD. Well, that's his vitals, as you can see. So no, no hiding from here. You can see that he's very tachycardic. He's a bit tachycardic. He's maintaining his saturations and his DCS is 15. So normal examination when you uh, examine him, normal labs except high DVD cameras. No DVD clinically. We did a quick ultrasound and find out there was no DVD actually on the ultrasound doctor as well. And surprise, surprise, we find the CDPE confirmed the low bar PE on the right side. So I'm not hiding anything from you. This is a straightforward patient who comes from the long haul flight and gets the PE. So we call it as uncomplicated PE, or some people will talk in a second whether it could be provoked or unprovoked or not. So he was discharged because he was well enough. He was discharged on rivaroxaban after a couple of days by on 15 milligrams twice a day 
for 21 days and then 20 milligrams once a day for three months. So essentially, DOAX or NOAX, whatever you call them, are not preferred the treatment. So he was discharged in one of them and discharged for three months treatment. Now, the next slide will take you to the poll. So I'm gonna ask you, so is this provoke PE? So get your, uh, on your mobile or wherever. So is this provoke PE? Do you think is this provoked due to transient risk factor? Is this provoked due to persistent risk factor? Or is this an unprovoked PE? So please, uh, I, I can see there are a lot of audience here, there are a lot of participants here. So uh, please submit your uh, answer so we can all go for the poll results. I'll give you around 15 seconds more so that you can come up with the poll. Okay, so let's get the poll. Okay, so that's interesting. So there is a mix here. So I don't think so. So no. So uh, you can see there is a large variety. Some people are saying is uh, eighteen percent provoke E, thirty five percent due to transient risk factor, twenty six percent persistent, and unprovoked twenty one percent. So this will be an interesting session because it's a mix here. So let's take you through to the next slides and we'll answer this. Believe me, in the end, again we'll go back to this. Answer. So remember your answers as well. Okay. I just need to go back to the next slide. And now you just have to come out of the poll. And... Okay. Yes. So that takes me to the next slide. Now, uh, we just had this uh, suggestion of provoked or unprovoked. Okay. Just for a second, this is the new concept is coming up. We now talk more about transient respecter, persistent respecter, or no respecters or no identifiable cause. So keep that in mind because this is now more and more you have to document, you, ha you should be documenting it, and you should be keeping in mind. So when we talk about transient respecter, we talk about major transient respecter. So like general anesthesia, a patient having the general anesthesia more than 30 minutes, major surgery, having C-section, or being in the hospital, let's say, come with pneumonia, and been in the hospital bedridden for more than three days. On the other side, you have a day case surgery, you have been confined to the bed less than three days, or you're pregnant. So that's a minor transient risk factor. Both obviously can lead you to provoke VTE. How about the cancer patients? That's kind of persistent or irreversible risk factor. So that's a persistent risk factor, again, can lead you to provoke VTE. And what we used to call as idiopathic VTE, unprovoked VTE. Now, with this, as you rem remember, so the guidelines used to recommend that you give three months treatment for provoked VTE and you give an extended treatment for uh, uh, unprovoked VTE. Okay. Now, is this just diagram? I have just made it up. Actually, if one slide you want to remember, one of the slides which you want to remember or rather take a picture of this, this is the one. This comes from the ESC. This is European Society guidelines. Uh, from the cardiology 2019, so very recent, and they described it more of a like, a, you can say is a green, orange, and red like a, like. So if you have a low, so they describe that you have a very low risk of recurrence if you have a major transient risk factor. We just talked about them, which ones? Like you have a patient who did a surgery, major surgery, you have been in the hospital for more than three days and bedridden, or you have major trauma with fractures, okay? This is a low recurrence risk because you have a reason for having the PE. How about the intermediate? These are the, this is one area where we tend to forget. The longest, you can see that there are some reversible risk factors like minor surgery, you have an admission to the hospital, but less than three days, you are pregnant, you have been confined to the bed, you had a leg injury, remember? So look, this is one of our patients, long haul flight. So this was actually, intermediate risk because it's a transient risk factor and it's a minor transient risk factor. So it's not a major transient, major risk factor. It's the minor transient risk factor. How about minor persistent risk factor? So IBD or autoimmune diseases. And like we said, no risk factor comes again. So remember, 38% still 30 risk of recurrence of VTE. 
about high risk, we know about active cancer, we know about hydrocarbon BTEs, and we know also about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So I'm trying to show you we are moving away from provoked and unprovoked now to transient risk factors or persistent risk factors or no risk factors. Does it really matter? It does, because why it matters is that Again, an old slide, as you can see from Lenda from 2003, time event here since months. And if you, if you stop anticoagulation treatment, you can see if it was provoked by the surgery, hardly no returns. But if it was provoked by a non surgical risk factor, we just talked about somebody who had a recent long haul flight, your risk goes up as the time passes. And as, of course, with the unprovoked, it's even more. So as the time passes, your risk of recurrent VTEs actually if you stop anticoagulation, it goes more. Okay, so that takes me so to, to the next question, which is that so you gave this patient actually three months of treatment, remember we just talked about. So do you stop this reverximent at three months? Would you continue reverximent for six months with 20 milligram once a day? Would you switch it to aspirin? Would you switch it to RIVA lower dose after six months or switch RIVA to low molecular weight after three months? Again, I would, uh, I would ask you to uh, take the poll and I'll take a few seconds. So hopefully we'll have a poll now. Can we have a poll? Uh, I can't see the poll. If we... Okay. Interestingly, so this time we have a bit of mixture. We have some more of almost like half of you I start. We have a, like a river seven continuing for six months. So somebody muted me. I hope you can all hear me now still. So you have a, uh, if, if you have a, a almost 50%, 41% of river continuing 20 milligram once a day for six months. You have 20% are stopped at three months. You have few who want to carry on with 10 milligrams once a day for six months. And actually, so there's again a mixture. We'll come back to that again as well. So let's just move away from the poll. Remember your answers. And I'll try to answer those again in my next few slides. Uh, I need to move to the next slide. Come off from the poll. Okay, so to answer that question, there are several trials we've done for extended VTE treatment. Okay, uh, you can see on your uh, screens a busy slide. You can see the Dabigatran uh, having resonated in the study that compared both placebo and warfarin with 150 milligram twice a day. You have Rivaroxaban where they compare 20 milligram with placebo. And then you have another arm, which we're going to talk about uh, shortly. You have Nexaban, again, amplified extension, where they compared both doses versus placebo, aspirin, or FASA trial, SPI trial, and you have Sudoxide, which is a combination of low molecular heparin and durant sulfate. Again, not a very common drug, and you compare it with the placebo as well. All, most of them were superiority trials designed like this. So let's take you to the Einstein extension trial. Now, oh, Einstein extension trial, the famous trial, uh, beautiful randomized double blind placebo control trial, where they gave the patient six to 12 months of anticoagulation treatment. And what they did is then they randomized the patients to reverse 20 milligram once a day, and placebo uh, versus placebo. You can see both arms around 600 patients, so 1,200 patients in total, 600 patients, and then the 30 day, uh, you have a 30 day observation after treatment cessation. Well, let's see the results. Okay, there's no surprise here. What you see is that actually that 
after time to the event, again, you can see time to the event on the bottom and you can see their current page. You can see the River Rocks event had eight events and Placebo had 42 events. And as you can see, very early on, around after six weeks, suddenly you can see the River Arm is here, okay? And the Placebo is going up. So incidence rate for on Placebo is um, is more. So what do you see is 82% relative risk reduction, 5.8% absolute risk reduction on patients who've been given approximately 20 milligram once a day. So does it come with, of course, this is good. Does it come with a uh, price, uh, with something to pay for? Yes, of course, the bleeding you worried about, but not to our surprise, not much. So they described as major bleeding event, of course, on placebo side, zero. Okay, but on the major bleeding side, you can see the four events. The events were defined as more than two gram or more than uh, two units blood transfusion needed. So three GI bleed and one menorrhagia. So 20 milligram once a day when extended, better, recurrence rate lower, but comes with the price. Okay, so that takes you back to you. So you have to judge. You have to judge and balance the risk of recurrent VT on one side, okay? If you stop it without anticoagulation, or if you carry on, you have a bleeding risk if you carry on, okay? So is it your choice? Don't forget, I said patient, okay? Patient is very important. Discuss with him, ask them that, you, should I carry on and explain them the risk and the benefit as well, okay? That takes me to the next, which is Einstein choice in a beautiful study where they compared Remember, 20 milligram once a day, 10 milligram once a day, and aspirin 100 milligram once a day. So again, they have been given six to 12 months of anticoagulation, randomized to three arms, and then compare later on with their recurrent risk of VTE and mid bleeding. Okay, you can ask me, where did that come from out of the blue? So we were fine with 20 milligram once a day. Why suddenly now we're talking about 10 milligram and aspirin 100, mil aspirin 100 milligram? Now, we just talked about 20 milligrams, so no need to talk about, we just said that there is 80% relative risk reduction. 10 milligram actually comes with record trials. The record trials, obviously, all for the so orthopedes are ahead of us. So they did on the, for thrombophoresis for elective hip or knee arthroplasties and found them the risk was, the recurrent VTs was less in these without major bleeding risk. So, and where this aspirin comes from, I just mentioned you. So, uh, uh, Aspire trial, Aspire, Varfasa trials showed there was a 30% relative risk reduction actually in compared for uh, gain of VTEs. Okay, so that's where it comes from. So, let's see the results. So, see again, let's see the results when you compare 20 milligram versus aspirin. You can see on your slides that uh, there's 17 recurrent VT events on rivaroxaban arm and 50 events on aspirin arm. So, relative risk reduction of 66%, which is uh, which is statistically significant. When you compare with 10 milligram versus aspirin, again, there's 13 on the river and 50 on the aspirin arm. Remember, they were not compared to each other. So both these doses were not compared to each other. They were compared with aspirin. As you can, as you can see, that when we went from 20 to 10 milligram, the benefit is still there. Okay? How about the bleeding risk? Okay? So the bleeding, again, when you compare with 20 milligram versus aspirin, again, six major bleeding versus three, and five versus three. So when you go with Revaroxaban 10 milligram after six months of treatment, actually, your risk of major bleeding is even lower, though you still retain the, re the recurrent VTE benefit. Okay. So now, just a slide to show you where we started from. We started from somebody who started on Revaroxaban 50 milligram twice a day and then followed with 50 milligram once a day. And as we know, this was compared with anoxaprine. We then went on to extension, Einstein extension, where these were compared with placebo. And we know that Revaroxaban was better for current VTs. We then compared both doses, 20 and 10, and both were better than aspirin. So statistically significant. So in terms of rates of recurrent VTE throughout, you can see that from one dose to other dose, there is a benefit. Okay. How about the major bleeding? Of course, when you, when you compare uh, the major bleeding, when especially when you will be compared with the placebo arm, 
okay, there will be more risk, okay? But when you compare with aspirin, it's less, it's, it's a simpler risk, okay? So the bleeding risk is there, but the VTE, recurrence of VTE is far better. So back to those, uh, again, provoked and unprovoked business. Does it really matter? Then we see that uh, throughout, when Antonio now is relying on you to decide, do I have an unprovoked VTE? Do I have a provoked but minor transient risk factor? Or do I have a provoked but minor persistent risk factor? As you can see throughout, Rivaroxaban has shown that if it's an unprovoked, it will reduce the risk. It will reduce the risk if it's a minor transient risk factor to 0.4%, and will, it will reduce the risk even if it is uh, to per minor persistent risk factor, it will still reduce the risk of VDE. Okay, so does that uh, uh, like replicate in the real world? Yes, you can see in the, both in recurrent VTEs and the major bleeding, the same data which I just showed you has also been replicated in the real world as well. So it's not just the trials, it's also been replicated in the real world data as well. So back to Antonio, first one. So those of you, uh, we remember we had a bit of kind of a uh, very picture in this one. Uh, I think we, we find out now, as we learned, that there was a provoked, which is transient risk factor, which was a long haul flight. So some, just keep an eye on this persistent risk factor. Bees and obese. I reckon there was also those who clicked on provoke due to persistent risk factor. If they were talking about obesity, that is one of the persistent risk factor as well. So we just talked about this. Okay. So we just find out that actually, at, because he's got still three to eight percent intermediate risk, so the risk is intermediate. We should be continuing this rivaroxaban at, at six months. We should switch rivaroxaban to 10 milligrams to reduce the risk of bleeding and carry on to reduce the risk of recurrent VTEs. So I, I tried to answer these here. So let's move on. Okay. So is this just the river? Is the drug which has shown you throughout from one end to the other end the choices with the Einstein and then extension and then the device? No, but there have been other trials as well. So for, for instance, Amplify Extension, that's the epic seven trial. Now, I will not tell you in more details about this, but as you can see from this diagram as well, again, so both epic seven, five milligram and 2.5 milligram far better than placebo for recurrent VTE. When compared for the major bleeding, you can see the 2.5 milligram BID actually does very comparable to the placebo. Five milligram, of course, had a bit of more bleeding risk than 2.5 milligram twice a day. So, but 2.5 milligram is okay. How uh, about Debigatrin? So, Debigatrin was compared with warfarin here, and Debigatrin then was compared with placebo. And again, you seeing the same trend. You are seeing the recurrent VTE risk profile better. How about the bleeding? Here, the warfarin was compared with Debigatrin, and here, the Debigatrin was compared with placebo. Of course, when you compare with the placebo, you will have a more bleeding than the placebo. Uh, but so it comes with the price, but in terms of recurrent VTE, it gives you a benefit. How about Aspire? Aspire compared aspirin, aspirin with placebo. Okay, so you can see that there is a VTE risk. So you can see 0 0.09. So for recurrence of VTE, uh, it goes lower. And then you have a major vascular point 0 0.01. So aspirin is far better in, in terms of major vascular risk factor if you compare with the placebo. So this is a pool analysis to compare aspirin and warfarin. As you can see on here, the pool analysis for VTE, you can see the, the diamond, it's well towards this, so aspirin is better. Uh, as you also can see for major vascular events, again, better, but it comes with a price of a bit of bleeding. So back to our Antonio. So we answered two questions. I hope you learned about the minor persistent and minor transient risk factor in our patient. Now the patient comes back to you. He finished his six months, okay? And he's asking you, should I continue to expand? Same dose, okay? Should I stop? Because I don't want to, okay? Is there any point? Should I switch Reverex now to 2.5 milligram BID? Remember at this stage, this patient is on 10 milligram of Reverexaban, okay? Or should I switch Rivaroxaban to noble epilaptoin or switch to aspirin? 
So again, you guys can uh, opt for the polls. I'll give you another few seconds. Ten seconds more. Okay, let's just see the polls. Okay. Well, we have a kind of tie again between three. Okay, so some of you saying Konireva, one third, one third of you saying switch to Epixaban. Uh, it's interesting choice. I think probably I'm not sure why uh, you you wanted to switch it to Epixaban, which we can talk about. And then some saying switch to Aspirin. Another interesting one. Okay, so let's uh, take out of the poll and let me share the next slide. We'll answer that, don't worry. Okay, so we'll answer this by looking at the guidelines for VT extended treatment. Okay, so I'll quickly go through. So 2014, remember that's six years ago. So ASCO said that if you have a cancer guideline, so if you have a cancer patient with active chemotherapy or metastatic disease, you should be extending it beyond six months. Okay, so ACCP, just physicians, 2016. What they're talking about, if it's uh, the same thing, if it's uh, provoked by a non surgical transient risk factor, you give it for three months. But you give it, you stop it at three months if it's a high risk of bleed, but you should be extending it with a scheduled stop, okay, with a low or moderate risk of bleeding. Essentially, they're saying if it's a first unprovoked E1, Okay, you should be extending it if there's not much risk of bleeding. That takes me to the NICE guidelines. Now, NICE, as you know, uh, it's, it's from UK uh, and me, I'm from UK, so I can, I can vouch for that. So very recent uh, 2020 guidelines. What they are talking about the benefit risk assessment, which I kind of showed you the balance, isn't it? So, so there is a balance between the risk and the benefit. So you assess the patient at three months and they tell you that if it's an unprovoked uh, VT or at six months in patients with cancer. So you assess them at three months or at six months if the patient is it uh, with, having, with having a cancer. So simple. So they said if it's a provoked major transient risk factor like we just talked about, stop. If it's an unprovoked or persistent risk factor, then you extend treatment, but very important with patient preference. Okay, so you ask the patient because it's gonna it's gonna have recurrent VT risk. Let's extend it. They also consider using Hasblad score. My other colleague is gonna talk about more maybe AF. Okay, now Hasblad has been more validated for atrial fibrillation, not for VTE, but they consider using this or modified bleeding risk factors to reduce them down for major bleeding, but consider stopping. Okay, obviously, if it's greater than four, so if the risk is more, then you stop. So if the current treatment is not tolerated, they're also giving you options. So the more, those of my audience who wanted to switch to Apexaban, yes, I will switch to Apexaban if it's not well tolerated or there is some allergy or the person's preference has changed. They want to go for twice a day for some reason or whatever. For people who declined continued anticoagulation treatment, so you don't want anticoagulation for whatever reason, it gives you bruise, it gives you bleeding, it gives you platelet problem or whatever, you want to go for aspirin, that's fine. That's your choice as well. So ESC, we just talked about this in one of my slides, provoked, unprovoked, gone. So no more supported. Okay. Now it's potentially misleading, as they said. Okay, in cancer patients, interestingly, adoxabin or rivaroxabin should be considered as an alternative with word of caution for patients with GI cancer, okay, because of the increased risk of bleeding. So I will probably try to just quickly skip this. This is what they want. ESC wants you to assess the patient at three to six months with saying whether they have got symptoms, see whether they have got BNP whether they have risk factors for CTPS, or may have attention, do the VQ scan, and then refer to the this CTPH, um, uh, CTPH experts for consideration of further diagnosis and treatment. And that's very important, especially when the, you have a big PE, you have a patient with PE and ongoing symptoms. 
Okay, I want you again, the second slide, which I want, is a busy slide, I want you to spend much time on this one. So first of all, as you can say, the top line, so for three months, anticoagulation for greater than three months is recommended for all patients with PE. Okay, so one day, at least three months, we're gonna give it for everybody. How about the major transient or reverse breast factor? Application of what I've already said, one B recommendation, you stop at after, uh, uh, so discontinue after three months. So you give beyond three months, definitely for two reasons, okay? One, the ones who have got recurrent PE and the ones who have got endospholipid syndromes. So these are the two indications where you're going to be given beyond three months for sure. One B. How about where this test should be considered? So they're saying if this is recommended, this is should be considered where you have no identifiable respect to the ones which you used to call as anthro PE. Okay. How about those we have a persistent respect? Now, as I mentioned, one of our patients, our patient in Pune, you can consider if he's still being, if he's still not doing lifestyle changes, he might be a persistent respecter having, and you might consider beyond three months for this. Okay, minor transient or reverse respecter. Again, comes our patient, so you have a minor transient long haul flight, and you want to consider extending it because of the risk of flight. Okay. Uh, two things. So, MOAC introduces. One five milligram BID of XMN and a reverse ten milligram once a day should be considered after six months of therapeutic anticoagulation. And aspirin, or the doc said, may be considered as an alternative who don't want anticoagulation. Okay, so this is just to show you the prediction models of the risk uh, risk stratification. So several models. I don't want you to bore with those. Uh, Dashta, Demos, Otava, these are all the risk models to assess the risk that how much risk I have for having recurrent VT, though it also depends on, like I just talked about, transient persistent risk factor and untrue uh, and, and no identified risk factor. Let's go back to our patient. So what he's saying is that we have a patient, we know that our guidelines recommend that we have a patient in Tony who has persistent and minor transient or reversible risk factors in both. Okay, so it is recommended for reversible and consider reduced dose after six months of treatment. But then this patient will be a we will be reduced giving the reduced dose of reversible ten milligram once a day. You can use an alternative of epixaban as PSC guidelines as well, two point five milligram twice a day. So when you go back as I talked about patient preference, you ask Antonia, what, what he's telling you, I don't want to live in fear of having another PE and ending up in hospital again. So for his preferences, I don't want PE again. So you have to explain. So, so going back to the question choices, so those of you remember we had three choices. Some of you wanted to continue. I think probably it's a, it's, it's, it's a valid choice who wants to continue with the same dose of our experiment. As per patient preference, you can go to aspirin. Again, that can, yes, the ones who went to see for the reason that the patient wanted a patient preference, yes, you can go for them. So, last couple of slides. This is just to show you that NOAC are now the first line of treatment, as you can see, as per treatment, class 1A recommendation, when oral antibiotics started with patients, NOACs are recommended. The hot PE study showed you that this can be used very easily. I use a lot in ambulatory care in UK, where the patients who have a low risk, we use whether PASI score or simplified PASI score, you can get them home easily. And the last slide before taking questions is about the future. So a beautiful trial, what I found was the COVID trial, which tried to compare the warfarin versus epictamen 2.5 milligram twice a day and reruxaban 10 milligram once a day. Unfortunately, as you can see, because of the lack of en enrollment, it's been but I wish if there is further trials where these all and maybe even aspirin, I think probably can be compared, or maybe other drugs as well can be compared to see what's best for our patients. I'll take questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wakar, uh, for this very, very elegant presentation, which uh, is also very educating. Uh, 
uh, for all of us. I think we might have three questions for you from what I can see here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mustafa or Ziad could help us with the uh, with the questions. Ziad. Uh, okay. First uh, question comes from uh, Juan Komar. Uh, he says that middle cerebral artery thrombosis post thrombectomy. What is the recommendation for low molecular weight heparin and aspirin? Uh, and I I can answer clear. that. I can answer yeah, that, sure. but I think it would be better to better to leave it for Basam because he, he is talking more about stroke and atrial fibrillation. So I will leave that uh, question for the second after the second talk. Uh, because this is not VT as far as I, I can see. This is not yes, about this is VT. an arterial arterial thrombosis, obviously. Okay. This is a, a different uh, different area. Mm -hmm. uh, no studies about that at all. It's going to be, if you're going to do it, basically you're going to be doing it based on an anecdotal uh, data. I mean, it's very tough to find studies. I mean, low molecular weight heparin following uh, macronis or the whatever, NOACs following from big Um I don't think there are, I mean, I'm unaware of any guidelines with regard to that uh, question, honestly. That's a very specific question and usually I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna answer that question, I don't think there are studies to answer that question. First of all, you're not gonna have any randomized trial in that direction. Even studies, if you're gonna have anything, it's gonna be based on anecdotal data. That's a very tough question. Uh, he's uh, he's I mean, basically he's talking about uh, following from big to me, even not uh, for like brain, yep, yeah? for middle mm -hmm. cerebral, what anterior middle cerebral artery from big to me. What we have is that we have basically, for example, uh, thrombolytic therapy for acute stroke. But even those, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether if we have anything for uh, low molecular weight heparin on, 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 uh, or basically on NOAX on, on that direction. I'm not sure. So uh, I, I agree, Doc. I agree. Actually, there are no trials. So whatever you will be giving, you will be just giving as an anecdotal evidence. And you, you might be, I mean, you might argue whether you just give aspirin or you might give just dual integrators, but that's whatever you give it, it's, it's, it's actually uh, just out of the trial. So there's no trials specifically try to look at post from patients with middle cerebral artery thrombosis. See, I mean, there is, there is an entity in the European Society of Cardiology regarding if somebody uh, developed a bleeding on an antithrombotic, and that's uh, basically in the, I think it was in the 2016, there is a, um, if you're gonna look at the, uh, basically the recommendations, there is a specific entity, if somebody bled uh, in the brain, in the past, if you have a single bleeding, people will chicken out of putting patients on anticoagulation. Um, in the European Society of Cardiology recommendation, I think it's a class 2B indication, that if you have a bleeding in the brain after six weeks, you might start a uh, basically NOAC. And in that direction, they actually put for you, it's where the watchman, if you're gonna look at the guidelines, it's basically for the watchman when it comes. So they're gonna give you like somebody who had a, a bleeding in the brain and where to go, would you go to the watchman or you can go for a uh, basically uh, reintroduction of a, um, an antiquary. And in that direction, that's just, they are talking about the, uh, the NOACs. And there are uh, questions there that you have to fulfill. They talk, they talk about whether if the patient is higher risk, lower risk of really bleeding, age, uh, weight, uh, alcohol consumption. There are, uh, some, I think, some six or eight factors that you have to basically answer before you decide where to go from uh, that part. But for thrombectomy, I'm unaware. Honestly, I'm unaware of. Um, I'm not sure you're gonna have, you have anything. That's. I mean, that's very tough to get to get a randomized control trial in that direction. It's very tough. I don't know what part about you. What would you think about? No, that? no, I agree. I agree. I think probably we'll move to the next question. I agree. Yeah, the uh, the, the 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 other two contributions uh, are just. Uh, uh, saying that uh, they they enjoyed the presentation. There's one last question, which uh, you probably have two or three minutes to answer that. Uh, somebody, uh, Muhammad Saad, he's asking, 
uh, about how long for and what doses do you use uh, in these days with uh, with COVID around? Uh, so hey, again, it's uh, like I, I didn't get the question. I mean, if are you talking about COVID and VTE? Okay? Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I guess seems so. Like. Yeah, I guess so as well. Yeah. So uh, of course you can argue that it's COVID. So it's uh, in in old term this. Uh, it's a provoked, okay? provoked even, and you can also say that it's it's a transient risk factor uh, because it's it's not persistent. Uh, hopefully, it's not persistent. But as you know, COVID is new for uh, all of us. Okay, so again, it depends on the risk profile. With our patients, uh, we have seen loads of uh, COVID patients, and I'm sure all of you guys have stories and recommendations. We have developed our uh, uh, post-discharge prophylaxis as well, depending on the risk profile. So if the patient's D-dimers are quite high, if the patient is high risk for other reasons like obesity uh, and any other reasons, okay, we also extend the prophylaxis, extend the v, uh, VTE treatment, okay? So, uh, but again, you can, uh, we give the lower dose, okay? So you, you sub, so, so you can give something like three months uh, VTE treatment, you assess them at three months, you probably do the D-dimers at three months, you assess their age, all the other risk factors, and then take it from there whether you want to extend their prophylaxis or not. Okay. Does that answer your question? Maybe, hopefully. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a reasonable thing to, uh, to, to do because, uh, as you said, we don't really know the course of the disease. I mean, there, there, there is talk about the a new syndrome, which is being called the prolonged COVID, which uh, some people have really uh, very protracted course and uh, recurrence of, of, of quite severe disabling symptoms. So I think I totally agree. I think it's uh, it's a logical thing to to try and continue the treatment for as long as possible. Okay. Uh, I don't think there are any more questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I personally learned quite a lot from it, uh, and I'm sure all the uh, attendees must have learned something from it. Uh, we move on to Dr. Bassam. Uh, Dr. Bassam is a cardiologist from uh, Ministry of Health in Kuwait, and he is going to talk to us about uh, atrial fibrillation, stroke, diabetes, and uh, uh, Dr. Bassam. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar, for the introduction, and I'd like to thank uh, for uh, inviting me to be with you tonight. And I'd like to welcome everybody from UAE. And I hope that all of you are staying safe and sound with this uh, pandemic during those difficult times. And I appreciate uh, everybody that's cutting from their precious time to be with us uh, tonight. Um, so basically what I'm, what I'm gonna do over the next half an hour or so um, so I'm just going to give you a brief outline about what I'm going to talk. So initially, I'm just going to touch base on the uh, ESC 2020 uh, AFib guidelines, just to briefly, just to give you an outline, okay? Um, then we're going to touch base on some new aspects. Uh, after that, you're going to notice that uh, all of the, uh, basically, the, uh, if you'd like to say the references are anywhere between 2016 and 2019. So this is a very new topic. You're gonna notice that a lot of the uh, data we're gonna talk about are based on retrospective analysis. And the reason is that because it's a, um, basically it's a new thing and it does involve uncommon areas. The, the nice thing that what, what, I, what I like about this topic is that we're gonna be talking about specifically about the interaction of diabetes with AFib, renal impairment, and vascular death. Actually, if you're gonna look for the mother uh, trials of the RCTs, those are just mentioned tangentially. So um, basically the way that I'd like to look at it is that it gives you as a clinician more options and more dimensions when you come and treat patients with atrial fibrillation. The whole idea, when I give actually lectures in this, in this direction, I never mean to influence the uh, audience to, to use, for example, any of the uh, NOACs. But what I tell them at the end of the day, if you have a patient in the clinic, you have to add a lot of data together 
And then you have to decide which is the best option for this specific patient. That's the whole idea of the talk at the end of the day. Okay, so basically let's start. So uh, you, I think all of you are aware of the 2020 European Society uh, guidelines for the management of atrial uh, fibrillation. And I think the new thing which happened in this guideline is that we are talking now about the holistic approach, about the ABC approach. Now the 2016, they already started that because they started talking about the five domains to facilitate an integrated structured approach to AFib care and promote consistent and guideline adherent management for all, uh, for, for all AFib. In 2020, they basically went through that continuum. They persisted with that continuum. And they are concentrating now on looking at the patient's values, the patient's subjectivity, if you'd like to say. So when you treat a patient, uh, if you remember in the old days, we were thinking of atrial fibrillation. You have, is the patient in uh, basically hemodynamically stable, unstable? You sort of, you are losing this touch. You are looking at the holistic patient. You are looking at a patient from all of the aspects so the first question they are asking, those are the four S AFib scheme for the structured management of the AFib. So they are talking about basically the, uh, here, the uh, stroke risk reduction. So the first question you're gonna ask is this, what is the chad VASC score of this patient? Then you're gonna be talking about AFib and the symptom severity and uh, severity of the AFib burden. So that's the arrhythmia portion, if you'd like to say. And finally, you're going to be talking about the comorbidities uh, and cardiovascular risk factors. In our talk today, I'm going to be concentrating on three of the major cardiovascular risk factors with regard to AFib, atrial fibrillation. So we're going to be concentrating in this domain. Of course, a stroke risk is going to be there, but you pretty much you know the data. What we're going to be looking is that for specific cardiovascular risk factors, how we're going to be uh, treating those patients with regard to stroke uh, reduction. And basically, when you look at the patient nowadays, it's not about you should not wait to treat the patient. Actually, you should be aiming and controlling the risk factors. So our job is to prevent the patient reaching to a stage where we develop a a stroke. So what we need to do is that we have to be very aggressive with our hypertension control. Again, if they develop, of course, atrial fibrillation, you're going to anticoagulate them so that you prevent a stroke. Eliminate excessive alcohol consumption, smoking cessation, diabetes prevention, cholesterol management. Actually, in the Gulf, for example, diabetes, if you're going to look at all of our countries, be it Kuwait, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, diabetes prevalence is anywhere between 23, 24, 25, like each one country is going to be plus one, minus one percent. So this is a major thing. The same thing with the smoking cessation. So, and hyperlipidemia, hypertension. I think a lot of you are aware we had some uh, basically collaborative work in the Gulf with registries. We have looked at ACS. Uh, we have looked at hypertension, HDL fibrillation, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. So we have lots of registries going on there. And when it comes to the management, so this is basically the ABC pathway. So you're looking at anticoagulation to avoid the stroke, better symptom control. That's basically for the uh, EP guys, arrhythmia management. So we talk about beta blockers, antiarrhythmics, ablation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the part that I'd like to make the link here is that the comorbidities and the cardiovascular risk factor management with regard to anticoagulation choice and uh, avoidance of stroke. So when it comes to the ABC anticoagulation, the first job is that you have to, you have to ident identify who is a low risk. Those are at zero to one. Then you can identify who are those ones that they need anticoagulation. If it's a man, it's more than one, and uh, it's a woman, two or more, it means that they are basically, um, uh, should be anticoagulated. And now you know that basically uh, most of the patients, they should be on a, a NOAC rather than a vitamin K antagonist, un, uh, except for 
uh, basically mechanical heart valves or rheumatic heart disease with moderate or more uh, mitral stenosis. Better symptom control, again, that's out of our jurisdiction of the talk today. Comorbidities, we're gonna be talking about uh, basically three of those uh, comorbidities. So our concentration today is gonna to be about diabetes and renal impairment in the holistic management of patients with atrial fibrillation. And that's what I was talking about with regard to the comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factor management. So this is the link that I would, I would like you to uh, be paying attention to. So we're gonna be looking here, not about all of those risk factors, what I'm going to be looking for, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and vascular disease. So those are the three among all of the rest. And actually, we do have data about some of those risk factors. What I mean here is that for you as a clinician to make a decision, which patient should you start on which NOAC, you have to look about all of those factors, and you should come at the end of the day with one decision. And that's what we mean by the holistic uh, basically management. And again, this is a repetition. So this is the European Society 22 recommendations for the prevention of thromboembolic events in AFib. So you start with for stroke prevention in AFib patients, basically the recommendation is to go with uh, NOAX. Excluding, that's what I mentioned to you, patients with mechanical heart valves or moderate to severe mitral stenosis. Anybody else should be on basically NOAC. If you're gonna add pregnancy there, you might add pregnancy as a third option, if you'd like to say, okay? So once you decide about what to choose, then you have to think who, which patient should I be starting a uh, basically risk assessment. So if your VASC, Chad VASC score is zero to one, zero in men and one in women, you don't anticoagulate. If it's two in men and three or more in women, then you should anticoagulate. As we have mentioned, that you should go with the uh, DOAC is your best, your best option. Uh, there is an entity now, which is basically those patients, a man with a Chad VASC score of one or a woman with a Chad VASC score of two, those patients are class 2A indication to, throw, to basically anticoagulate. In those patients, you have to sit with a patient, you have to discuss with the patients the pros and cons of each of those options, and then you come with a final decision. Now, this is an important factor that basically came strongly in the 2020 uh, guidelines, is that we don't look at high bleeding risk alone as a reason to withhold anticoagulation, because when it comes to high bleeding risk in the guidelines, they talk about modifiable, versus non-modifiable risk factors. A clear example of a modifiable risk factor is hypertension, for example. You might have a, a patient who presents to you in the clinic or in the in hospital, in the eMERGE, with an initial blood pressure of 200 or in the clinic with an initial blood pressure of 180. So then he comes to you later on, you treat his high, his high blood pressure and the blood pressure becomes controlled. So then, this is a modifiable risk factor. There are, there are factors which are non-modifiable, non such as sex, okay? So that's what the guidelines are trying to, to tell you. The other important thing here is that once you start and uh, basically an, uh, any DOAC, you have to start the appropriate dose for the right patient. And if you start the appropriate dose, then you're gonna get the clinical benefits that have been seen in the, in the, in the clinical trial. So if you look at habixapan, dictabicatran, rivaroxaban, if you, if you treat your patient according to the appropriate dose, you're gonna reproduce whatever was found in the uh, RCTs. And if you're gonna look at the different NOACs and their um, uh, basically the patient's adherence to the different NOACs. It depends on the value. So we mentioned that, first of all, the patient has to comply with the medication. Two, I have to make sure that the patient is taking this pill according to the uh, what the pill should have been taken. For example, abixaban and uh, dabigatran, they should be taken BD. The problem with the D BD is that sometimes they could 
they could basically forget to take a pill, especially in the elderly. Now remember that because they might have a bit of forgetfulness. So they might take a BD pill and an OD pill. And this is a problem because basically once you uh, base, uh, take the pill less than 80% of full adherence, then that's gonna translate into uh, basically inefficacy. And that is why if you look at all of the NAWACs, if you look at the patients who are less than 80% adherent, that's going to lead to a 1.5 uh, basically increase or 50% increase in the ischemic stroke, which means if you don't comply with a pill as was given in this study, that's going to actually, the pill that you are taking is not going to benefit you. Actually, it might cause harm more than benefit. And this is an important concept for not only anticoagulation, but it's an important concept, even in heart failure, hypertension. This is extremely important. For example, remember interest in heart failure, the, the, the dose which gave the benefit was 200 BD. If you give your, your patient 50 BD and the blood pressure allows you to give 200 BD, don't expect that you're going to get the mortality benefit because in the trial, the benefit was seen with the 200 BD. And this is an important concept. So again, if you're gonna give the patient BD, we have to make sure that the patient is complying with the pill. When I'm gonna give the OD pill, I have to make sure that I'm looking at the whole patient together. Am I aiming for a stroke, for example, and systemic embolism reduction? In this case, you might think of dabigatran, or maybe my patient is elderly now, he, he's forgetting then, and he has lots of pills, then I'm gonna think of rivaraxaban. That's why you have to look at your patient. And if you're gonna look here at basically uh, the uh, therapy adherence, uh, which one, which patients get better adherence, you're gonna see that those pills which are given once a day, they have better adherence which is here, as you're gonna see, you're gonna notice here is that Rivraxabam and, warf and Warfarin, okay? So the patients have less confusion with the pills. When it comes to the BD, a lot of those patients, some of the patients, they take the BD pills once a day. And by the way, from my clinical experience, it is there actually. Uh, sometimes I give my patients, I, by the way, I prescribe my patients all of those pills. And I choose the, the patient that I'm giving the pill. So basically, when you give the pill, you have to make sure that the patient is adherent. But by common sense, all the pills, they have better adherence uh, with the uh, patient. So that was the first uh, part of the, uh, the talk. Now I'm going to jump to the second part of the talk, which is the important part of the talk. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to try to disappear the guidelines. Um, by the end of the talk, I want you to understand why is it important to give X patient this anticoagulation while Y should be given that uh, basically uh, anticoagulant therapy. So let's imagine that we have a patient. His name is Amin, and he's a 76 years old gentleman. It's basically, this is the garden variety patients that we are seeing in our uh, clinic. He has atrial fibrillation, he's diabetic, and he has moderate renal impairment with a creatinine clearance of 46 mils per minute. And he's, he's basically worried because he has a friend that had a stroke and he needs a caretaker each day. He ended up on dialysis and he's really scared that he, this could happen to him too. And he wants to do everything possible to avoid to reach to that fate. Now we know that kidney disease occurs in around one in a three patients with type two diabetes mellitus. And diabetes is a major cause of kidney failure who require dialysis. Moreover, chronic kidney disease and diabetes are more likely to die from cardiovascular causes than uh, those without diabetes. As you are aware, I'm pretty much sure that you know that right now patients with chronic kidney disease based on epidemiological data, they represent risk factor for premature atherosclerosis. If we look at the AFib, kidney disease and diabetes, those are independent risk factors for a stroke. And you're gonna be very surprised if you look basically at the 
um, cumulative, if you'd like to say, uh, risk factor of developing cardiovascular endpoints, it is something similar to the cardiovascular risk factors. You remember that if you have high blood pressure alone, you're going to have a certain percentage of having uh, basically coronary disease. If you have diabetes alone, if you have hypercholesterolemia, smoking, but you have the four of them, your risk is going to be multiplicative rather than additive. And here you have a similar picture. If you have AFib, kidney disease, and diabetes, you have a very bad, basically, uh, combination. If you look at chronic kidney disease, it is associated with 30 to 60% increase in the risk of stroke, so that's alone. AFib alone is associated with a five-fold increase in the risk of stroke. Diabetes is associ associated with a two-fold increase in the risk of stroke. And this is what I like about this slide. It just reminds me of the slide of the Framingham with regard to the cardiovascular risk factors. So this basically slide shows you the total mortality, which is in dark gray, and the cardiovascular mortality, which is in light gray. This is the, your total and basically cardiovascular mortality if you have nothing of those risk factors. If you have diabetes alone, your risk is around 11.5, kidney is 17.5. Once you have both of them, look at this. Basically, this is your cardiovascular mortality. It almost like in compared to placebo or baseline, this is like what, six times more? So it's not like one plus one equals two. It's like, I mean, I don't know, one multiplied by two by four, and you're gonna have this basically multiplicative uh, increase in the risk of both cardiovascular and total mortality. And when it comes for basically such an age for the, for the, the elderly patients, those who are basically a mean, this, there was a study that looked at this page, uh, at this age, uh, which was the Saphir AC. The mean age was 86 uh, uh, years. Their uh, mean CHAD VAS score was 4.6. Obviously, it's very high for CHAD score. And they had a relatively high, uh, basically, vascular blood. And in this group, if you basically look at the uh, major bleeding uh, chances of having with regard to uh, vitamin K antagonist versus Rivaraxobam. Rivaraxobam, even at this age, at the advanced age, it was, it was having a better profile with regard to major bleeding, less intracranial hemorrhage, less stroke, and overall less mortality. By the way, I want you to look at the mortality here. This is around 20%, okay, 19%. This is not significant, I know that, but I want to just to pay attention to those uh, percentages. Intracranial hemorrhage, if you're gonna remember anything, you just remember around 40% reduction. You're gonna be dead on, you're gonna be right in most of the NOACs. So now let's look at the diabetes related risks. Um, I'm just gonna give you this very quick uh, question. Um, it should be a very quick thing. I mean, a uh, very simple one. What are the biggest fears of any diabetic patient? So what do you think about, about all of those uh, answers? I mean, my questions are simple, easy, nothing too uh, fancy about them. So I think we can give you about, what, 10 more seconds because it's very easy. Okay. Let's see, where are we? Are the poll, is the poll ready? Okay, yeah, so the majority of you, they, and this is basically the feeling of all of us, like basically as a patient, you're going to be, you are looking after, I mean, you, you know, don't have really, I mean, you are looking at the holistic patient. That's what the whole thing. So you're not only looking at cardiovascular events, amputation, all of those things are, are really important for you as a patient. And if you look at the comorbid uh, diabetes and its prevalence uh, with regard to the risk of a stroke and cardiovascular uh, death in patients with atrial fibrillation, whatever risk factor, whatever endpoint, whether it be a micro or a macrovascular endpoint, if you have diabetes, basic, uh, sorry, if you have uh, atrial fibrillation, 
you're going to have those risks in those patients with AFib, they're going to be exceedingly higher than non-AFib patients. For example, if you look at the diabetic retinopathy, 23 to 40%, and that's basically based on NOAC RCTs. Nephropathy, 22 to 29%. Diabetic neuropathy, one in three. Stroke, two to four-fold increase. Cardiovascular death, eight out of 10 individuals with diabetes die from cardiovascular events. Actually, I'm going to pay your attention to a, uh, a registry that we have done in the, uh, basically in the Gulf with Dr. Kalim. And uh, it was involving Kuwait, Oman, UAE, uh, Bahrain, uh, and Yemen with us together. And in that registry, we have shown that in the Gulf, patients who develop atrial fibrillation, they present younger by about a decade compared to their uh, counterbalanced uh, uh, European uh, registries, if you'd like to say. So this is an important thing for you to appreciate. In the Gulf, our patients, not only they, they have those risk factors and that's those comorbidities, they are actually younger and they present with much more uh, serious disease. Now, if you look at patients with diabetes with regard to the uh, risk of stroke and bleeding events, um, now, remember that diabetic patients are a higher risk profile than the non-diabetic patients. So if you have a medication that basically provides equivalent stroke, pre uh, basically prevention and major bleeding, but yet decreased intracranial hemorrhage, you are probably going to go with that medication. And this is very clearly see seen here, is that rivaroxaban provided effective production uh, against stroke as good as warfarin and major bleeding, but much less intracranial hemorrhage in diabetic population. So now we're not talking about the whole, the overall, but that's pretty much in the diabetic population. And this is now the most important thing that we're gonna be concentrating on. So now we are approaching to the, to, to look at the vascular uh, complications of AFib in diabetic patients and how NOACs, help in that direction. So in the rocket AFib uh, basically study, we looked at the rivaroxaban that showed consistent safety and efficacy compared with warfarin in non-valvular AFib patients with diabetes. And remember, in this basically study, diabetic patients composed about 40% of the uh, population. Probably this is the, major, this is the biggest uh, uh, percentage among all of the NOAC uh, studies. So what you're gonna notice here, is that when it comes to primary efficacy, stroke or systemic embolism, it's as good. Vascular death was less by about 20%. Major bleeding, as good. Intracranial hemorrhage is about 38% reduction. So again, so in diabetic patients, rivaroxaban was as good as warfarin in protecting from systemic embolism and the stroke, but we had the advantage of having less vascular death and less intracranial hemorrhage. And when it comes for the protection from cardiovascular death in patients with non-valvular AFib and diabetes, those are basically the results from different, uh, the three major uh, RCTs that we have, the rocket AFib uh, for rivaroxaban, aricystal with apixaban, and rely with regard to the dabiketran. And the three drugs they gave you basically uh, almost similar benefits. What I want you to notice here, look at the cardiovascular death. It's about 0 0.8, 0 0.89, and 0 0.81. Actually, when, when we looked at the RCTs uh, for the three of those, for the three pills, uh, this cardiovascular death reduction was not a statistically significant. However, there was a pooled analysis of the four in, in addition to those. Uh, that looked at the cardiovascular mortality and the overall there was about an 11% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. And in that is tri trial, it was a meta-analysis. Uh, this uh, benefit was statistically significant. Now, when it comes to the stroke uh, prevention and systemic embolism, just notice that the superior one is basically uh, Debigatran 150. You remember that from the RELY trial. When it comes to major bleeding, they are better. Now, of course, in the uh, basically in the Debigatran, if you give the 150, you had much more bleeding, GI bleeding largely. When it comes to intracranial hemorrhage, the three of them share the same thing. And that's what I'm talking about now. 
So you have to look at your patient, see where your patient is falling, and then you're gonna look into that. So we are still in the vascular, uh, basically uh, endpoint here. So this is a retrospective analysis of the US proven market scan database, looking at the effectiveness and safety of rivaroxaban versus warfarin for the prevention of major adverse cardiovascular events and major adverse limb events. Um, yes, it, it is a retrospective analysis, but honestly, you don't have any other studies looking into that. And it's a very brilliant study. You can clearly see here is that when it comes to the maze, it's chemical stroke, and I'm, I'm going to talk about MI in a second, it's a neutral. But when it comes to the major limb amputation, surgical revascularization, endovascular revascularization, minor limb uh, amputation, it's definitely superior, no question about that. The reason that people are looking at MI, it, it came from the basically the first RELI trial. In the RELI, there was a negative signal with regard to a bit of increased MI, but it, not, it did not reach significance. And that's why there was a scare afterwards. And that's why all of the DOACs, the subsequent studies, they were looking at myocardial infarction and all of them have proven that there was no increase in the risk of myocardial infarction with the DOAX. When it comes to the risk of major bleeding, uh, basically, uh, rivaroxaban was similar to warfarin in patients with non-valvular AFib and type 2 diabetes mellitus. The reason I'm showing you that, when you look at any drug, if you have robust and uh, basically repetitive uh, same results, you're gonna feel much more comfortable is that the results are repeating themselves again and again and again and again, which basically uh, been seen in the RCT, in real life data and registries. And now you're looking at the same benefits at a uh, basically retrospective analysis. So as a physician, you're gonna be much more comfortable using those medications. So that was basically uh, the diabetes and the vascular uh, component. Now we're gonna end up with renal impairment related risks. So what are the biggest challenges in managing AFib uh, renal impaired patients? So this is a very quick, again, survey. Let's look at, uh, those are simple questions. Just uh, I wanna have a idea how people are thinking. Again, we'll give you about 20 seconds to finish it. Okay, I think we can finish up now. Let's see, where are we? Good. I think all of you are getting that. So basically, um, stroke risk, bleeding risk, progression to end stage renal disease. So we're gonna look into that, so that's a good thing. Okay, so it means that 11% of the audience, maybe they have here uh, something. Okay, so let's proceed with that then. Good. Now, among patients with non AFib, renal dysfunction is common and increases progressively with age. And actually, 64% of patients with non AFib, they have renal impairment. Renal and mortality in patients with non AFib atrial fibrillation. In some warfarin-treated patients with AFib, accelerated chronic kidney disease progression and acute kidney injury can occur in association with excessive anticoagulation. Uh, and those are pretty much basically new data. If you look at the rocket AFib, there is consistent safety outcomes in non-valvular AFib patients with moderate renal impairment. So if you look at basically patients with warfarin versus rivaroxaban, 15 milligrams, okay, those are moderate renal impairment uh, patients. What you get to notice is that the rivaroxaban arm, they are much more superior, superior with regard to less critical organ bleeding, less intracranial hemorrhage, and less fatal bleeding. So rivaroxaban is always superior to uh, warfarin when it comes to those things. Now, people were questioning why we are having this difference between 
basically vitamin K antagonists and uh, basically uh, the, uh, the NOAX. So this basically slide or figure shows you the, the comparison between uh, the control and vitamin K antagonists with regard to the decrease in the estimated uh, glomerular filtration rate. So if you are following a patient from zero to five years and you're looking at the decline in the GFR, which is a function of your renal impairment, at five years, patients who have been on warfarin, vitamin K antagonists, they do much worse. Their GFR drops much faster than the control. And they, what they have looked is that they looked at the, com, uh, the correlation between arterial calcification in the patients whom GFR has reduced. And they have found that arterial calcification is significantly higher in patients who have been on the vitamin K antagonist. And that is why the postulate, they postulated, there was a postulation of a, a theory that patients who have arterial calcification, that they have warfarin-induced renal impairment is probably related to increased arterial uh, calcification. Now, let's look at the following studies. So what you're gonna notice is that I'm gonna show you four studies. The first study is gonna look at renal function preservation comparing warfarin to NOAX, all of the uh, three NOAX. Then, so those are patients who have normal renal function, and we went and see if you are putting, putting them on a NOAC, they're gonna have a preserved renal function compared to warfarin. Two, we're gonna look at patients who have moderate renal dysfunction, what happens to them. Then advanced class four and five. And finally, I'm gonna show you a, a basically a real uh, world data on patients who are already basically having a dialysis. So those are the four levels of studies that we're gonna be discussing here. So the first one is the, uh, the, the US uh, retrospective cohort analysis using the Optum Lab data warehouse database. So this study looked to compare the effects of NOAX versus warfarin or renal outcomes, okay? What they have found is that in, in the NOAX, there was a, a basically more than 30% decrease, uh, decline in the EGFR in the warfarin compared to the uh, NOAC. There was doubling of serum creatinine in the warfarin compared to NOAX, and there was more acute kidney injury. So patients who were on the NOAX, they were 33% less likely to develop a 30% decline in GFR, 48% uh, less likely of developing doubling of serum creatinine and 42% less likely, or sorry, 32% less likely of developing acute kidney injury. So the NOAX were better compared to warfarin. So if you have started a mean on rivaroxaban, he would have had basically a much lower chance of having 30% decline in the GFR doubling of the serum creatinine, acute kidney injury, and acute kidney failure. And those things have been, and this basically has been echoed in the guidelines. You might say, well, it's a retrospective analysis. I understand that. But because it's an important part and we have no other uh, basically data available for us, it is acceptable to adopt some of those. And over time, NOAX, particularly the Begatran and Rivaroxaban, may be associated with lower risks of adverse renal outcomes than warfarin in patients with AFib. Be careful, patients with AFib, those are not patients with renal impairment. So those are patients who have normal kidney function. You put them on Begatran or Rivaroxaban, those patients will have a lower risk of having adverse cardio, uh, renal outcomes. Now we're gonna go to the second level, reloaded. In reloaded, this was basically looking at renal function worsening with NOAX versus warfarin in patients with non-valvular AFib and renal disease. So that's the difference. Be careful about the, the uh, flow of those studies. This was basically a German study and they looked into uh, that. So those patients had renal impairment. And this, retrospect, this retrospective dot database of patients with non-valvular AFib and renal impairment, 
it was very clearly that rivaroxaban, apixaban significantly reduced the risk of any stage renal disease compared to warfarin. And rivaroxaban was associated with a trend towards a lower risk of acute kidney injury compared to warfarin. Now, you might ask, okay, where is dabigatran? If you're intelligent, you know that dabigatran uh, below the uh, 30 mls per minute mark of uh, GFR is not indicated. That is why they studied rivaroxaban and apixaban. That is why in the coming studies, you, get, and you only notice the, uh, basically rivaroxaban is going to come again and again and again. Um, so in the reloaded study, there was a trend towards uh, risk reduction observed in the patients uh, with non-valvular AFib and diabetes. Now, remember, in this basically talk, we are, to, we, we are looking at different things. So we looked at diabetes alone. We looked at uh, basically vascular death. And in the reloaded, they looked at not only renal impairment, but they looked at renal impairment and diabetes. And again, the same benefit reproduced itself. You had less end stage renal disease and less acute kidney injury, but this benefit was much more seen in the rivaroxaban compared to apixaban. Now we're gonna go to the third level. So the caliper was a study looking at uh, basically AFib with advanced kidney disease, stage three or stage four. Again, this is another retrospective analysis but that's what we have. And they looked basically at kidney disease with or without diabetes treated with, now look at the dose here. This is the appropriate dose. That's what should you do because this patient now is having advanced renal disease. So you should use the lower dose of the rivaxabam. What they have found, the same message is coming again and again and again. Patients who were on rivaxabam had much less chance of developing or, or proceeding or progressing into stage five kidney disease, kidney failure, or dialysis. So the same benefit is happening again and again and again, okay? And if you're gonna look at this slide, the message that I would like, I would like you to, 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 to understand here, some doctors, they think that if they underuse a dose for I mean, you're going to see every now and then people putting a patient on, I don't know, uh, uh, Pradaxa 75 milligram, um, Zarelto uh, 10 milligrams for AFib, I mean. Well, you don't have evidence for that. If you're thinking you're going to protect the patient, this is not the, right, this is not the thing. If you look at Abixaban here, they, they used an underdose. What happened? They caused much more uh, stroke and systemic embolism. So you're not protecting the patient you are causing much harm by giving a lower dose. So the summary of my talk is that as follows, approximately one in every three patients with AFib have comorbid diabetes. So it's very common. Diabetes increases the risk of stroke, cardiovascular death, renal function decline, and major adverse uh, limb events. In patients with AFib and comorbid diabetes, it is possible to avoid both irreversible macro and microvascular complications. The choice of anticoagulant is important. There's evidence that suggests patients with AFib and diabetes receiving NOACs have not only a reduced risk of a stroke system, or need of lower limb revascularization, amputation, and they experience less clinically relevant renal decline. So what does this protection mean for our patient? I mean, Remember, he's 76, non-valvular AFib, his GFR is 46 mL per minute, and he's diabetic. So he has all of the bad things on the world. He's gonna, we're gonna prevent him from stroke. We're gonna preserve his renal function. We're gonna mitigate basically bleeding risk. We're gonna prevent cardiovascular death. We're gonna protect him following stent placement in some of the studies. We're gonna give him the optimal dose, and we're gonna support uh, him in adhering to the right dose. And with that, with that, I'll come to the conclusion of my talk. And thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bassam, for this uh, uh, comprehensive review uh, of the data uh, uh, and uh, very clear 
messages here uh, about how to uh, improve these patients' risk factors and how to prevent uh, cardiovascular death and complications in these patients. It's uh, usually quite a, a difficult area of management, but I, I, I think you have simplified it and uh, uh, very clear presentation. Now, I, I, I see that we have maybe uh, some time constraint here, but we will go very quickly through the questions. You have 10 questions. Okay. Uh, let us uh, start with a question here. It says, an elderly patient with a Pixaban, but had recurrent bruises. He had history yeah. of uh, hip. Uh, what is the alternative? or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So the patient uh, is an elderly taking a Pixaban, had recurrent bruises, uh, and uh, he has history of uh, thrombocytopenia with heparin. What would you use? What's the alternative? Okay. So basically, uh, I mean, do you want me to take it or? I mean, I, yes, I don't please, know. yeah. Uh, but, okay. Now, so basically for HIT, I mean, hit is with heparin, so I mean that's that per se. With regard to the now the anticoagulation, you have I think to look at the patient all together, okay? And that's what I mean. So, how old is the patient? What we need uh, basically from the anticoagulation? Are we looking for basically for his age? If it's above seventy-five, so be sure that we don't have any uh, NOAC that is uh, basically superior with regard to uh, stroke and systemic embolism reduction. The only superior one is dabigatran. So that's important to understand. Okay. So if he's, he's, if he's older than 75, so you're not looking for uh, systemic uh, embolism or stroke uh, reduction. That's one. Two, if the patient is having only bruising without having hemoglobin drop or bleeding from mucosal surfaces, GI, major bleeding anywhere else. Uh, basically, you're gonna look at the, I think you have, you, you should look at a, a NOAC that is gonna be associated with the least bleeding. And probably you wanna look at a NOAC that you have an antidote for. Now, we are aware that basically, I'm not sure what you, and you have to be thinking what you have in your local hospital, what, what NOAC has an antidote, that's just in case. So if you have the, the basically the plexibind or anything, uh, or the basically for the other three uh, antidotes, that should factor your decision. If you don't have an antidote at all, I think in this patients, and you're really worried about bleeding, Honestly, I think you should think of uh, basically uh, a uh, left atrial appendage closure de device. And that's what I meant by the holistic picture. You have to look at your patient, ask the specific questions for this patient. Does he have renal impairment? What we showed you basically is that uh, for specific patients, the, for each patient, the answer is gonna be different. If your patient has renal impairment, for example, creatinine clearance less than 30 in this patient, he's going to have thrombosthenia because in renal patients, uh, basically their platelet is not acting well. They're gonna, they might have a bit of thrombocytopenia and you cannot use definitely the uh, Pradaxa. So Pradaxa is going to be out. So you're not going to be thinking about an antidote for the Pradaxa. So you are left with choosing either uh, basically uh, Zarelto or Apixaban. And in those patients, if you are worried about bleeding, I think uh, left atrial occlusion device is a, is a viable option in this patient. So that's my take about it. I don't know what, what I would think about it, please. Can I just add, uh, if, I, yes, if I may? So, so Dr. Massam, thank you uh, for the nice talk. Uh, I completely agree as a holistic approach. I think probably you mentioned most of the things, especially going back on why we are actually giving Epixaban. So what's the indication of giving apexaban? What are the risk factors of bleeding? As I understood, there might be a question about specifically about it. So with the use of it, there has been some, uh, the recently some Mormon and colleagues actually uh, did uh, recently quite in 2020, February 2020, I think probably 
had to look at all the case series and case control studies on specifically look at the hit heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So what we found is that actually in from Hamilton, Venkatan colleagues, if I remember correctly, and then Davis colleagues for Epixaban. So Davis looked at Epixaban and Venkatan looked at the Rivaroxaban and Epixaban and reported that DOAX, when there is a when there is hit, you can use DOAX easily or in uh, but two uh, two DOAX have been used, Epixaban and Rivaroxaban. So if I get the question right, if the patient is on Epixaban and if you are worried about specifically about Epixaban, you can use Rivaroxaban, but the right dose, please. Okay, depending on the other risk profile. But if the bleeding is that much, obviously that you are quite worried and the bleeding risk is much, then obviously you have to think about, like you said, appendage closure. I think uh, if I can just add uh, something to, uh, to to the conversation, <laughs> uh, my approach will will probably be a little bit uh, a little bit tough with these patients. I mean, uh, the first thing I will tell the patient that uh, unfortunately you 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 have you have to take the anticoagulation because once the patient is taking a pixaban, there must have been a very clear indication for him to have the pixaban. He must have a high a, a stroke risk. Now you tell the patient that uh, as, as if he stop the anticoagulation, he will get a stroke. A stroke is likely to kill him. If he continue to take the apixaban, he's gonna get bruised, and a bruise will never kill anybody. Uh, I think you probably have to, before you make any major decisions on this to try and av avoid minor trauma because bruising, if, if it's spontaneous bruising, that's obviously is a problem. But if it's, uh, it's uh, in my experience, it's usually. The bruises are in areas where the patients are sus susceptible to sort of like ma minor trauma. Uh, walking by the bed, they hit the bed uh, on the on the edge of the bed, or uh, they they hit their arm on the door as they walk into the kitchen, and that type of thing. Usually, you find the bruises in areas where they have been subjected to trauma. So, you just try and advise the patient. Uh, to try and be a little bit more careful because uh, they are on anticoagulation, they likely to bleed under the skin if uh, if 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 they if they have uh, some form of trauma. Also, a bruising is not a is not a a, a manifestation of or is not a, a precursor of an internal bleed or a major bleed. I think the the mechanism of uh, of 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 a skin a skin bleeding is probably different yeah. from major intracerebral bleeding or GI bleeding. Uh, okay. I'm just, I'm just may I might add something. Just there is a clinical point as well here. See, be careful with those. All of those are the elderly patients. Make sure that they have no bruising because of falls. If they are falling, make sure that they don't have a subdural hematoma. I mean, sometimes yeah. that that fine you do you 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 do see, you do see catch it catch it actually. You do get every now and then, if especially they are uh, being accompanied by their family members. <laughs> if they start telling you that they are having some memory gaps recently and they are having bruising, think about subdural hematoma. That's a side thing, basically, clinically. Yeah, it's it's important. Okay, well, I think we've passed our time, uh, and, and there doesn't seem to be many questions. Uh, most of the uh, entries here are people just congratulating the speakers for a very nice presentations and. Uh, they are just expressing their gratitude and how much they have learned uh, and enjoyed the presentations. Uh, and in the end, I would like to thank Dr. Wakar and Dr. Bassam for thank a very you, nice Dr. evening uh, and a very educating uh, 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 talks. And also, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Noor, Mustafa, and Ziad for uh, making this possible. It's been it's been very nice and very. Successful. I noticed that we at one point we had uh, over 175 attendees. Uh, I hope they've all learned something from this. Uh, and we thank Bayer for uh, sponsoring this uh, nice presentation. And uh, thank you all very much. And good night. Uh, sleep tight. And uh, uh, until we see you again. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Basan. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice meeting you.